again for joining me as we study the book of Revelation. And we've just started a mini-series on the letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And our last time together we looked at the church at Smyrna, and we could call it the Suffering Church. It was a group of believers who had faithfully endured even the most intense persecution. At the time before that we looked at the church at Ephesus, and we could call that church the Apathetic Church. Uh, because they were a church that had left their first love. And today we're going to look at the church at Pergamos. And before we do, just to remind us where this uh, church is located, uh, it is located just due north of Smyrna. Um, again, all of these churches are located in Asia Minor. And as you can see there on the map, it's the broader region uh, where modern-day Turkey is today. Uh, the city of Pergamos was founded in the 5th century BC. Uh, they attained a high degree of artistic and intellectual culture. And really around the time of the writing of Revelation, this letter to the church at Pergamos, they boasted a population of 200,000 people. It was situated atop a steep acropolis rising some 1,300 feet above the Caicos River Valley. The folks there at Pergamos built just numerous magnificent public buildings, theaters, a multitude of temples, and a healing center. There was also a library at Pergamos, a well-known library. In fact, what, one of the things that made this library so well-known was that Pergamos was the first to make widespread use of parchment. Um, really goat and calf skin. And much of the New Testament manuscripts, those early writings, were written on parchment. And hence uh, why they were preserved for so many years. Pergamos was also known for its Asclepion. It was a medical center, really consisted of multiple uh, medical buildings. It even included a healing tunnel. And you can see remains of that even today. It's very much well intact. That tunnel opened up to a treatment center. Tragically, the, many of the medical practices there at Pergamos were intertwined with ritualistic practices, pagan practices. Pergamos was heavily influenced by paganism. And as a testimony to this fact, you can see just many temples that were erected. There was the temple of Athena. There was the temple of Dionysus. There was the Red Basilica. It was a temple dedicated to a false god. There was also the temple of Trajan. Trajan was a Roman emperor. And the Roman cult was very strong. The idea that the Caesar, the Roman emperor, was God himself, deifying the Roman Caesar. Pergamos was heavily saturated by satanic influence. There was an altar of Zeus that sits atop this Acropolis, really overlooking the city. And it was a huge altar measuring approximately 100 feet wide by 100 feet long and sat on a podium 20 feet high, a massive altar. God specifically references the fact that Pergamos was the seat where Satan dwells. But in the midst of all of this, a church was born. Jews, Greeks, Romans were saved out of this pagan culture and gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And we have here in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 12, we have a letter to these believers who have been saved out of paganism. And let's read the letter that God gives to this church at Pergamos in verse 12, Revelation chapter 2. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there, 
them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And what we have here is God's letter to the church at Pergamos, and I want to highlight three things specifically, actually four. Um, God's commendation, that's what we'll look up first. Then God's rebuke. What does God rebuke them for? And then thirdly, God's warning, God's call to repentance. And then fourthly, the reward that God gives to overcomers. Those who heed the exhortations given in the previous verses. Let's start with the commendation. What does God commend this church for? Well, notice back again in verse number 13, He commends them for holding fast to my name. You have held true to the name of Christ. This was what God commends them for. They had been saved from paganism, and by God's grace they had been kept from returning back to their old lifestyle, to their old habits, their old way of living. They had held true to the name of Christ. And imagine the uh, persecution uh, that would have come to these believers because they were so different uh, from their culture. And yet they decided, no, we're, we've given our lives to Jesus and we're not turning back to the paganism that we've been rescued from. Well, God commends them for this. He also commends them uh, for the fact that they have held true, not only held true to the name of Christ, but they have remained faithful under persecution. These believers at Pergamos experienced intense persecution, much like the believers at Smyrna. Uh, they had been persecuted for their faith. And there's one name specifically mentioned of a man who gave his life. His name is Antipas. And God refers to him as my faithful martyr. And church history tells us, well, we don't know for sure, but tradition tells us that Antipas was put to death by being placed in a red-hot brazen bull and literally burned alive uh, for his faith in Jesus Christ. A horrific way to die. And yet Antipas, uh, perhaps a leader there in the church at Pergamos, uh, was willing to give his life for the cause of Christ. He refused to recant. He refused to go back to the paganism that he had been saved from. What a testimony. And God commends the Pergamos believers he commends them for their faithfulness to endure persecution. That you've held true to the name of Christ, and you've also faithfully endured under persecution. Well, then God gives them a rebuke. And let's look at this sobering rebuke. It's in verse number 14. But I have a few things against you, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And so God rebukes these believers at Pergamos uh, for two things. They had there within their assembly those who held to the doctrine of Balaam, and those who held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They tolerated these two doctrines. In the first rebuke, they had tolerated the doctrine of Balaam. What was the doctrine of Balaam? You remember who Balaam was. He was a prophet in the Old Testament. Now remember the story where the king of Moab was concerned for his safety and the safety of his nation. And God was blessing Israel 
And so King, uh, the king of Moab, Balak, got an idea and said, Let me ask Balaam to come with me and curse Israel. Well, Balaam, of course, went with the princes of Moab, but uh, God stopped him from cursing Israel. Well, king of, the king of Moab, Balak, had promised Balaam wealth and riches if he would just curse Israel. And Balaam wanted these riches so much that he was willing to compromise. And so what he did was, even though he couldn't curse Israel, he decided he would corrupt Israel. And he came up with this strategy where the Moabite women would intermarry with the Israelite men, and there would be intermarriage between uh, the two nations, and as a result, Israel would be, would be corrupted. Well, that's exactly what happened, and it brought God's judgment on Israel. Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 15 gives us insight into this doctrine of Balaam which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. We could sum up the doctrine of Balaam this way, compromise with the world for selfish gain. And that's what these believers there at Pergamos, they had allowed into their church, even into their own personal lives, compromise with the world for selfish gain. You see, these believers were were good Christians. They had held true to the fundamentals of the faith, we could say. They had held true to the name of Christ. They didn't turn back to paganism. But in their practical lives, uh, they had allowed the uh, influence of the world to creep back in, uh, perhaps uh, for selfish gain, uh, to make their lives a little bit easier. Uh, perhaps uh, to fit in a little bit more. Uh, and isn't that a temptation for us as believers today? God has called believers to be set apart, to be distinct from the world. And there's a temptation for us to accommodate the world, to make our lives a little easier. Of course, that's the lie of the enemy. Well, that's the doctrine of Balaam. What's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? You tolerate also the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The word Nicolaitans uh, comes from two Greek words. The first one has the idea of to conquer, nikao. And the second one has the idea of the laity. Uh, perhaps, we don't know a lot about this cultic group, uh, but perhaps... The Roman Catholic Church, some of the teaching of putting a division between the clergy and the laity, establishing priests as mediators between the common people and God, perhaps finds its roots in this Nicolaitan um, group where they put a key distinction between those two classes and we reject all of that because believers, according to the Bible, have direct access to God through the person of Jesus Christ. We don't work through a human priest. Uh, but perhaps the Nicolaitans had adopted some of that false thinking. Um, without a doubt, though, we do know that the Nicolaitans was a group that accommodated pagan culture rather than abstaining from it. We could call this the doctrine of the Nicolaitans uh, because and it involved not just the uh, fornication, uh, similar to the doctrine of Balaam, but also eating meats offered to idols. And so both of those uh, doctrines, the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, really involved accommodation of the culture, little compromises for selfish gain. And God rebukes these believers at Pergamos for their toleration of these two doctrines. Well, notice the warning that God gives to these believers. In verse number 16, repent. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. God gives them a sobering warning. He calls them to repent. And my friend, the only answer for you and I as believers for our response to fornication, for our response to the lust of our flesh, or for our response to this world is to flee. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. 1 Corinthians 10, 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. 1 John 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then Philippians 2, verse 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. God has called you and I as believers to be the light of the earth, to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. The principle of distinction can be seen all throughout Scripture. I think of Noah. God calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. In the midst of his wicked culture, God spared Noah and his family. I think of Abraham. God called Abraham out of his idolatrous family roots. I think of the nation of Israel. God called the whole nation of Israel to be separate, to be set apart from the nations that were around them. I think of, uh, for instance, the tribe of Levi. It was uh, one of the tribes, and it was set apart as a holy priesthood unto the Lord. You and I, as believers, are called priests unto God. And it's important for you and I to not be defiled by the wickedness of the world around us. Jesus said in John chapter 17, it was his prayer uh, that believers would not be taken out of the world, but that they would be kept from evil. And so when we think of our lives as believers being separate from the world, it's not as if we need to um, remove ourselves from the world in the sense of a monastic kind of a lifestyle. No, but it's a purity of life, a walk with Jesus that makes the difference in uh, keeping ourselves spotless from the world. It's possible to live as a believer pure in this life. And it's only possible through fellowship with Jesus. Not a matter of a list of do's and don'ts as much as a walk with Jesus. To obey Him in every area of our life. My friend... Believer today, can you say that you're pleasing the Lord in every area of your life? Are there areas that you're resisting Him? Are there areas that you're trying to keep control of? Are you grieved at what grieves the heart of God? If you and I as believers are going to be uh, light, or if we're going to be distinct, in our walk with the Lord, if we're going to be effective in our ministry to others, in our influence in this world as salt and light, you and I have to walk with God in fellowship and obedience to God. Well, that's what it's about. That's what God is encouraging. He's urging these uh, Pergamos believers, repent. You've allowed sin. You've allowed the corruption of the world to come into your life. Oh, Change your mind. Get rid of it. Change your actions, your behavior. Turn back to me. And he gives them a sobering warning. I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. If you and I continue to allow the world to permeate our lives, our thinking, in what we watch, in the activities that we're involved in, in the entertainment that we participate in, if we allow the world in any regard in our lives, we put ourselves literally in a position of resistance to God. We make ourselves an enemy of God. And as James 4 verse 4 calls believers who do that adulterers and adulteresses, who as a friend of the world are enemies of God. My friend, God's desire is not for you to be at enmity with Him. He wants to walk in fellowship with you. It only comes by walking in simple, faith-filled obedience to Him. 
where God has control of every area of our lives. Well, notice the reward to overcomers. This is what God promises to those who heed the warning. They choose to live distinct from the world. They're able to, as it were, be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use because they purge themselves from that which is dishonorable. Well, what is the reward? He gives two rewards in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. The first reward is that God promises that he will give hidden manna to eat. In the New Jerusalem, in, in eternity, the Israelites partook of manna in a very literal sense. It was their sustenance. Uh, it enabled them to go forward and do the work of the Lord. And in some way, uh, perhaps Jesus, of course, is called the bread of life. And in some way, uh, perhaps you and I as believers will, if we're faithful, will be given a sort of manna, food, nourishment, and sustenance to fulfill the work of the Lord in His coming kingdom. One of the responsibilities for faithful believers is to reign with Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 talks about if we suffer with Him, we will also reign with Him. If we endure with Christ, we will have the privilege of reigning with Him. And so perhaps this manna is going to be that uh, spiritual nourishment, uh, even perhaps physical nourishment, uh, that we need to accomplish the responsibilities in the eternal state. Uh, what an awesome thought to think about. And then the second reward that he gives us is a white stone. Um, to him that overcometh will I give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saveth he that receiveth it. So somehow God is going to give all overcomers a white stone that will have a new name on it. It's interesting in ancient times uh, when someone was guilty of a offense and then they, uh, actually I should say they were presumed guilty and then they stood before a trial, before a court and they were acquitted of that uh, charge they were given a white stone to carry with them. So at any point afterwards, if someone on the street or someone accosted them and said, Hey, you're guilty. Uh, they could pull out that white stone and say, No, I've been acquitted of the charge. Well, that was very much a literal use of the white stone in ancient times. And perhaps um, that will be the purpose of this white stone even in eternity. And again, not in a positional sense. All of us as believers have been washed white as snow from our sin. Uh, that's a done, settled fact. It is finished, accomplished by the blood of Christ. But this is talking about our walk with the Lord, our, the degree that we overcome in this life, and perhaps has an, uh, something to do with our practical walk with God. If you confess your sins, God promises He's faithful and just to forgive. Perhaps that white stone will be a testimony to the fact that we have been cleansed in our daily walk by the blood of Jesus from the sin of compromise, the sin of allowing worldliness, allowing worldly thinking, allowing worldly activities into our lives. Oh, my friend, these rewards, the hidden manna and a white stone, are rewards that God promises specifically to overcomers. And next time together, we're going to look at the next church, the church at Thyatira. But until then, let's focus on God's reminder, even through this letter, at the church to the church at Pergamos, that we need to live holy set apart lives unto God, fully dedicated to Him, not allowing compromise into our hearts. 
And so I trust you'll be able to join us next time as we continue our study on the letters to the seven churches.